time in prayer, doing everything I can to hear what Jesus Christ is saying to us through His Holy Spirit right now. Two weeks ago, Brother Wally shared a great message, Time for Change. He quoted Deuteronomy chapter 1, where God tells the Israelites, On your way now, get moving. You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Last Sunday, Pastor Ted preached a sermon entitled, This is Our Hour. He talked about God's supernatural timing and His timing for the church right now. The Lord has very clearly told me what the title of my sermon must be this morning. I have tried to work around it, but the Lord says, no, this is what I want you to share on. So God's message to us this morning is this. This is no longer business as usual. This is no longer business as usual. And I want to thank uh, Coral. Coral, thank you for working on, on the PowerPoint. Uh, I'm not very good with technology and design, but thank you, Coral, for, for doing that for us today. But you know what? If we just put those three titles together, I think we start to get an idea of what Jesus is saying to the people of Crossroads right now. First of all, time for change. Secondly, this is our hour. And thirdly, this is no longer business as usual. Over the past 10 months, we have heard in society and on television this statement repeatedly, get used to a new normal. Going back to the old normal is past. The world is forever changed. There's no going back to the old way of doing things. You know, global markets and businesses big and small are now looking at a landscape that seems altered permanently by this coronavirus pandemic. A host of retail chains have shut their doors or diminished their hours of business. As a matter of fact, I was watching CBC News last night and it says one in six businesses in Canada is considering closing down. One business analyst put it this way, one of the many things we've learned from this crisis uh, or of the many things we have learned, one is how difficult it can be to do business as usual outside of the office. Many organizations were caught off guard by the mandatory business shutdown triggered by this pandemic. While some companies were able to make the transition seamlessly, others were scrambling to create a workable virtual environment in a time frame that felt like a fast-moving tornado. Folks, there's a lot of change and adjustment going on out there. Now, you and I are all impacted economically and socially by the changes that we've seen. But today, listen to me, people of Crossroads Christian Assembly. God is saying to you and me, this is no longer business as usual for the follower of Jesus Christ. Repeatedly over the last three weeks, this phrase has come to me. This is no longer business as usual. You know, in Luke chapter 17, Jesus is describing what society will be like shortly before Jesus returns. And in verse 26 and 27, he says these words, and we should have it up there. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's time. Noah, uh, excuse me, Noah's day. In those days, the, the people enjoyed banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat and the flood came and destroyed them all. And then in the next verses, uh, the writer uh, or here, Luke says, and the world will be as it was in the days of Lot. People went about their daily business, eating and drinking, buying and selling, farming and building until the morning uh, that Lot left Sodom. Then fire and burning sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Yes, it will be business as usual right up to the day when the Son of Man is revealed. What Jesus was saying was that as judgment was about to be poured out on Noah's day and during the time of Lot at Sodom and Gomorrah, the people were completely oblivious of what was coming on them. They were just carrying on business as usual. And I cannot say this in strong enough terms this morning. As Christians, we simply cannot afford to carry on business as usual anymore. 
Folks, when your house is on fire and you are fast asleep, don't you think you would want someone to come and shake you as hard as they could to wake you up so that you could escape the danger? Well, that's kind of an obvious question. Of course you would. My question then to you is, does God care enough about us as believers and about humanity to bring shaking and warning in times of crisis? Oh, yes, He does. This world we are living in is experience a shaking like we have never seen before. In the New Testament, the writer of Hebrews speaks about these days that you and I are living in right now, these times of shaking. And this is what he says. Take a look on the screen, Hebrews 12, 25 to 27. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we, if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The word once more indicates the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. The removing of what can be shaken so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Folks, God is saying to us that through this time of shaking, if we pay attention to what God is saying, we will see that there are certain things that are priorities and other things that are not priorities in our lives. Did you know that everything you see with your natural eye will one day be burned up? will one day come to nothing. All of your businesses, all of your possessions, all of your wealth, all of your finances, it will all be burned to nothing. And God is saying, I'm shaking things today so that what cannot be shaken will remain. Do you and I recognize this morning the things that cannot be shaken? The things that are priorities in our lives? God Himself I thank God this morning. There's good news because there are things that cannot be shaken. And this is another sermon, but I want you to know that God himself cannot be shaken. The word of God cannot be shaken. The church of Jesus Christ cannot be shaken. And the child of God cannot be shaken this morning. And I thank God for that, but that's a sermon for another day. We're going to move on now. As I have prayed, I've asked God, Lord, what do you mean when you say this is no longer business as usual. Lord, I'm praying for change. I'm crying out for change. If you are saying that you want me to do things differently, what exactly are you saying to me? Where do I start? And the Lord took me to a well-known vision that the prophet Ezekiel had. Most of you are familiar with this vision. It's a rather... Uh, <clears throat> it's a rather interesting vision, a graphic vision. Let's take a look at this vision in Ezekiel 37. Starting in verse 1, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Ezekiel said, Sovereign Lord, only you know. I think Ezekiel is looking at those dried bones and he's going, doesn't look too hopeful for me. And then God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover with you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life, and then you will know that I am the Lord." 
And then let's move on. I think we can go to the next slide. Then so Ezekiel said, I prophesied just as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise. There was a rattling sound. And the bones started to come together. Just picture that. The bones start to come together, bone to bone. And I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the Lord, the sovereign Lord says, come, breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life. They stood up on their feet, a vast army. You know what Jesus was telling me? Jesus was telling me that I'm raising up a vast army. That my breath is going to come into my people. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, without my breath in you, you will accomplish nothing. You need to prophesy. You need to speak to the breath. Come, breath of God, and enter me so that I can live. What is the breath of God today? The breath of God is the Holy Spirit. Did you know that as Christians, we can be physically alive, but spiritually, we can be dead? You take a look at what Jesus said to those churches in Revelation. There are times as Christians where we can have the outward appearance of having it all together, but inside we have strayed away from our first love. We have strayed away from the things that were once priorities in our lives. Like no other generation in history of this planet, we are the ones who cannot take tomorrow for granted. Listen to me this morning. We must not put off until tomorrow spiritual decisions and spiritual actions which we can take today. So the big question this morning, how will these dry bones live? What can I do with my spiritually cold heart? We desperately need the Holy Spirit to breathe new life into our own hearts today. What are the conditions this morning that will lead to a spiritual awakening in my heart, in my church, in my land? What do we need so that the breath of the Holy Spirit will come? This morning, I am going to look, this is my text, and uh, Brother Dolu, thank you for confirming by the Spirit of the Lord uh, what my text was, because I'm referring to exactly the verse you just read. I'm going to turn, uh, I want us to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7. A beautiful picture that we see in verse 1 in 2 Chronicles 7. Solomon is dedicating the temple. The sacrifices have been made. And Solomon stands and he says, Lord, we dedicate this place to you for your glory. And it says, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. How many of you have an idea that maybe that had a bit of an impact on those people? Fire, it, they, the, the priest did not have to, to light the fire to burn the, those sacrifices. The Bible says fire came down from heaven and lit those sacrifices on fire. And it says that the priests could not, okay, let me back up. Uh, yes, the priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground. And they worshipped and they gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good, His love endures forever. I wish that I could have been there on that day. And then we skip to verse 11. And I think we can go to the next slide. It says, When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord in the royal palace, 
and had succeeded in carrying out all that he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord in his own palace, then he's in bed at night, and the Lord appears to him that night. And he says, the Lord says to him, I have heard your prayer, Solomon. I have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. What a beautiful picture. What a beautiful picture. But then suddenly the tone of God, God's message changes. There's a sudden change. There's a sudden shift in what God says to Solomon. And we're going to read it in a minute, but basically he says to Solomon, there's coming a time when my people are going to stray away from me, when my people's hearts are going to become cold, when my people will become uh, apathetic towards my word. They will no longer seek me like they should. And when that comes, God told Solomon, I am going to bring a time of shaking. I'm going to bring a time of warning to them. Take a look. Let's read verse 13. When I shut up the heavens so there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, when that shaking happens, what do you need to do, Solomon? If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Folks, it's as old as God's word is, but I want you to know that if we apply the principles that God gives us, the, 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 the result will be that God will come through every time. We've talked about the fact that whenever God makes promises, there are premises. There's a premise before the promise. The premise is right here before the promise of the outpouring of God's Spirit. The premise is that we need to humble ourselves. And then number two, we need to pray and seek God's face. And then number three, we need to turn from our wicked ways. And then the promise is, I will hear, I will forgive, and I will heal. Amen. This morning, let us take a minute to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us as individuals. Folks, you know what? We can pray for a revival for our church, but I want you to know that revival starts with the pastor. Revival starts with you as individuals this morning. We cannot expect God to turn, uh, to, to respond to us unless as corporately we turn to Him. This is about every one of us as, as members of this uh, church family this morning. Number one, humility. What on earth is humility? And how does it apply to what we're talking about this morning? I want you to know that God is saying that He's going to breathe spiritual life into us when we come to a place of complete dependence on Him. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be poor in spirit this morning? Does it mean that your bank account is empty? Does it mean that you're bankrupt? As a matter of fact, being poor in spirit is something that you want. Jesus said you're blessed if you're poor in spirit. I want to tell you what being poor in spirit means. It means that you realize how desperately needy you are and that God can only be the source of everything that you receive. The poor in spirit are those who realize at a fundamental level that they are needy people. It's the sign of humility. This morning, in order to accomplish anything in our spiritual lives, we have got to have the power of the Holy Spirit. God said to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 
Listen to me now. He's not talking about the heathen nations around. He's talking to his own people. Listen to it. When you eat and you are satisfied, when you build fine houses and you settle down, when your herds and your flocks grow large and your silver and your gold increase, he didn't say there was anything wrong with any of that, but he said, then your heart will become proud. And you will forget the Lord your God. Then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. Folks, why is it this morning that the church is so alive in places where persecution is the greatest? Why is it that the church uh, thrives when people are desperately in physical need? I'll tell you why, because those people have nowhere else to turn but to God. Today, we have all kinds of places that we can turn and rely on as, as, as followers of Jesus in Canada. We have become self-sufficient. We have been, become comfortable. I want you to know that for many, and I, and, I, and I want to say that in many of our homes within Crossroads Christian Assembly, God has become an afterthought. Being a Christian just simply means that you say grace at your meal or something like that. Men, I want to challenge you in your homes today. You need to gather your families together and you need to learn how to pray. Your children need to hear you pray. Your children, men, need to hear you take the lead in your home when it comes to spirituality. Folks, I want you to know that your Christian life is something that means so much more than just what you do on a Sunday morning. God is calling on us to become humble before Him and say, we need you. Teach your children that they need God in their lives. Don't rely on your own finances and your own programs. Don't take God's word for granted. We need to have an awe of God in our homes this morning. Listen to what a couple of verses have to say about humility. Folks, I want you to know that, that pride shows in our families when God and, and, and godly things are no longer a focus in our homes. Then we are proud. You may say, Pastor Steve, I'm not proud. I want you to know that pride before God comes when, we, when, when God does not become the focus of our home. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Take a look at Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. The Lord is saying this. He's saying, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Has not my hand made all these things, declares the Lord. But you know what? This is the person that I esteem. Who does God esteem this morning? Who does God respect and admire? He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. When last did you tremble when you read God's word? You know what scares me today? I would dare say that there are many of us in our church, in our homes, who don't even read God's word together, let alone tremble at his word. Can I challenge you this morning to take time? I want you to know in our home when I was a little boy growing up, there was never a day that went by that my parents did not gather together with us and read God's word and memorize it and pray together. Every day, we never missed. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. God is looking for people 
whose sufficiency is in Him. With a humble heart, a soft heart, a tender heart, not a hard heart. James chapter 4 tells us God opposes the proud. But you know what? When you're humble, He gives grace. Therefore, humble yourself before the Lord and He will lift you up. The last verse that I have on, 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 on this point, Isaiah 57, verse 15, this is what the high and lofty one says, He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, God says. But you know where else He lives? He lives with Him who is contrite and who is humble in spirit. And you know what? When He comes and He lives in that humble heart, what does it say He does here? It says He revives their spirit. He revives their spirit. Follower of Jesus today, this cannot be business any longer, business as usual any longer for us. We need to begin to walk the talk. We need to begin to live out what Jesus is calling his church to this morning. If my people who, will, who are called by my name will humble themselves. Point number two, if my people will pray and seek my face. There's a difference between those two. The second prerequisite in our lives is spiritual renewal. Any sovereign move of God throughout history has been birthed through prayer. And I believe, folks, that there is no other way that we're going to experience a refreshing in our own lives, a revival in our own lives. This business of prayer is so critical. I cannot express how strongly God has impressed that in my spirit. People of Crossroads, God is calling us to pray, to fall on our face before Him, and to cry for Him to renew us, to save our neighbors and our community and our city, to pray until we are endued with power. That was Jesus' promise. He told his followers, you go and you pray, and you don't leave that place of prayer until you are endued with power. Is there a difference between prayer and seeking God's face? I believe there is. I think that prayer can be basically our supplication before him, kind of our grocery list. We all bring a grocery list before the Lord and we say, Lord, you know, I need this and I need that and bless auntie so-and-so and bless grandpa and, and bring healing to so-and-so. You know what? Those, the Lord understands that. He's our daddy. He's our father in heaven. And he is glad when we bring those supplications to him. But folks, prayer needs to go beyond supplication. God is calling his people to not only pray but seek his face. What does it mean to seek his face this morning? What does it mean to seek his face? One of the words that we use is the word intercession. Another word we use is the, is, are the two words spiritual warfare. We need to learn how to do battle in the spirit through prayer. And you know what? If you don't know how, then we need to teach you how to pray. We need to teach you how to, sup, to, to come before God and begin to intercede. Begin to bind the strongholds of darkness. Begin to battle against the gates of hell and against the principalities and powers. My wife came into, I was, last night I was sitting in the office working on things yesterday afternoon and my wife came in and she said, she said, read this and, and I, I sent it out to the leadership team and, and basically says this, you know what, it's time to stop talking to God about our mountains 
And it's time to start talking to the mountains about our God. That's what intercession is. Intercession is taking authority in the name of Jesus and claiming the promises of God for us as his people. God told Solomon the night after he dedicated the temple, now my eyes will be open and my ears will be attentive to the prayers that are offered in this place. Do you think that God's ears are attentive to our prayers? Absolutely. But folks, we need to pray. God cannot hear words that we don't say. God is looking for his church. You know what? Here are some qualities of a praying church. Take a look. In a praying church, faith. Faith rises in our hearts when we start to pray. Faith looks towards the Lord. In a praying church, there's compassion for the lost. In a praying church, there's faith to demand miracles. In a praying church, the Holy Spirit manifests His presence and His power. In a praying church, there is mighty power in the message of the gospel that is preached. In a praying church, there is incredible grace that comes into the lives of God's people. Does that sound like renewal to you? It sure does to me. Does that sound like dry bones coming alive? It sure sounds like it to me. Can these dry bones live? I'm here to tell you this morning that yes, they can live. And not only can they live, but they can stand and they be can become a great army for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus told his followers in the Sermon on the Mount, he also said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. If you want to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit today, there needs to be a hunger. You need to be hungry. I know some of you are going, Pastor Steve, I'm ready to eat. I haven't eaten all day. You know, we're very quick to respond to the physical hunger in our lives. But when last did you really hunger and thirst after righteousness? When last did your spirit start to crave and say, I'm hungry for God. I need God in my life. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst because those are the ones who will be filled. Listen to David. You can hear the hunger in his prayer when he prays. He says, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly will I seek you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Is he talking about physical water there? No. He's talking about in this spiritual desert that I'm in. I'm earnestly crying to you. I need you to quench my spiritual thirst today. When we practice prayer, we'll be a people of power. If my people will humble themselves, if my people would pray and seek my face, Pray and seek my face. The third condition for spiritual renewal is if my people will turn from their wicked ways. Now I know that you're saying to me, Pastor Steve, I haven't done anything wicked lately. I haven't robbed a bank or a liquor store lately. I don't need to turn from my wicked ways. I want you to listen to what Jesus said to the church in Ephesus. Just take a look on the screen. It says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, 
write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. That's Jesus himself. I know your deeds. I know your hard work and your perseverance. You know what? We have worked hard. We have persevered, folks, as a church. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. I know that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered. You have endured hardships for my name. You have not grown weary. Wonderful accomplishments. But Jesus says this to the church in Ephesus, I have something to say. I have something that I hold against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. You notice he didn't say you've robbed a bank, you've murdered someone, you have committed fornication. He didn't say that. All he said was, you've forsaken the love that you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Folks, when we stand in the presence of Almighty God, we begin to realize how far we have fallen from Him. He, then Jesus says to this church, He says, just repent, turn, and say, you know what? It's not going to be business as usual anymore. That's what repentance really means. Repentance means it's not going to be business as usual anymore. It means a 180 degree turn and move in a different direction. Repent. Do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place. Repentance. Most of you aren't farmers here. Neither am I. But there's a term that Hosea used in Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. He said this, he said, it's time for us to break up the fallow ground. Hosea chapter 10, it says, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness on you. What on earth does that mean? What does it mean that we need to break up this fallow? What is fallow ground? Fallow ground is ground that has not been farmed for some time. Land that has been neglected. Land where weeds have started to grow. Land that is no longer soft, it's become hard. Fallow ground is an analogy of our spiritual condition. And God, through Hosea, says it's time to break up that fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord so that He can come and rain righteousness on us. Folks, that's what repentance is. It's just simply saying, Lord, you know what? My heart through the years has become cold. My heart through the years has become apathetic towards your word. I don't rely on you. I don't call on you like I used to. My love for you is not the same as it used to be. I want you to know it's tragic when in our marriages we forsake our first love. But it's just as tragic in our spiritual lives when that passion that we once had is no longer there. And I want you to know this morning that that's exactly what the enemy is looking for and you and I cannot let him win this morning. We cannot allow him to bring us to a place of just complete apathy and where we, we just uh, have no longer have passion to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so many times as Christians, we can put on such a self-righteous spiritual mask. You know, we're more concerned about how we appear to other people 
than to how we appear before God. You know what repentance is? Repentance is taking the time to say, Lord, I don't care about my brother or sister. I don't care about the church. Right now, this is between you and me. Lord, I want to know, what, what do I look like in your sight? Where have I fallen short? Lord, let me be humble enough to admit the areas in my life where I need you. Jesus said this, as I conclude this last point. He said in his Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Do you want to see God's glory in your life today? Acts chapter 3, verse 19. I believe it was Peter that said, Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Is that what you want this morning? That's what I want. In this time of shaking, I want the Lord to hear me. I want the Lord to heal my land. I want the Lord to bring revival. I want refreshing to come into my life. The Lord says, repent and turn to God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I'd like the music team to join me as we conclude our service this morning. I want to thank you for listening. And I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that somehow something changes in your heart. I pray by the power of the Spirit of God that something changes in my heart. Because it's time for a change. It's time for a change. We will experience God's blessing. We will experience God's power. That's his promise. But this morning, the premise is, if my people, if my people will humble themselves.